Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Adrian Cockcroft, and um, currently work at Battery Ventures. And why am I here? Um, well, I thought you hadn't had enough drinking games, so I should just do like, an in-depth uh, tutorial on microservices for the next two or three hours. How about that? <laughs> So, um, OK, well, let's not do that. So what I'm actually going to talk about, you know, what, how do we wrap up a conference like this? So I'm going to talk about simplifying the future in, in a number of different ways. But, but you know, really, why am I here? Um, let's just go with this. This is a tweet from 2012, retweeted by some guy called Andrew Clay Schaefer. Um, that what I was doing in 2012 was going around trying to explain all this stuff that Netflix was doing, you know, and I called it baffling late adopters as a service. Um, and we were pioneering, and we were trying to build things that hadn't been built before, and we were trying to explain things that hadn't been done before. And now, it's really, you know, this is more than four years later. Um, this has matured. It's now mainstream. It's now what a lot of people are doing, and it's what a lot of, pe lot of you are doing. So, where do we go from here, and how, do, how can we apply these lessons as we go forward? So that's really what I wanted to talk about. So think about the future. Let's start with a bit of science fiction. Um, let's start with this one. What's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? Right? You know that? What's the answer? 42, right? Well, that's a simple. That was really simple. I can go now, right? Um, so sometimes really complicated things have simple answers. Um, and there's another very useful thing from this particular uh, story, which it comes with a very nice label on the cover about not panicking. So that's good. But if we think about this, life is complicated. There, you know, it's, it's an extremely complicated world we live in, but we seem to manage to deal with it. There's a lot of simple abstractions we use for dealing with life and dealing with all the things that we're working with and all the things we're building. So I'm going to talk about the, thing, the things that are complicated in our lives, things that are complicated in the way we build things and the way we work, and then a little bit about sort of where things might go. But what do I mean by life's complicated? If you think about somebody saying that's too complicated, what they're really saying is, I can't figure out what it's going to do next, right? It's, I can't intuit its behavior. It's got too many moving parts, and I haven't figured out an internal model of what it works, of how it works and what it does. So think about that. What's the most complicated thing that you can do intuitively? Let's think about that question. Like, just think about it. So how do you get around? Are you driving cars? This is, this is like driving is one of the most complicated things that you could possibly think about doing. Like driving across a city, you have to know how to control the car. You have to be able to deal with the other traffic. It's, it's insanely complicated. It's quite dangerous. But we expect just about every human being in the world to be able to do it. Right? That, is, that's, that shows the capability of humans to master complicated things when they have a real need to do it. So that's, that's one area. Think of something else. What's the most complicated thing that, that your, your kids can do from about the age of two? You know, how many people's kids have an iPad? <laughs> like, what is going on inside that little lump of glass and aluminum? It's, it's the insanely complicated what is actually happening inside an iPhone, iPad, a tablet, or whatever, a games console, those things. But pre-verbal kids can pick up an iPad and just descend into it immediately. You don't have to send them on a training class and to learn how to figure out how to use this thing. And we still have these problems with kids. You know, one of the problems we discovered um, with, with you know, thinking about sort of TV and vis the, the way people interact with TV sets, we kept discovering that, you know, the bottom of your TV set has got this mucky stripe on it where the kids are trying to, like, get the thing to go to the next page. <laughs> and, and I have one friend that said they can't watch TV with their kid in the room because it gets incredibly upset at this stupid thing that is not behaving properly because they'd learned that this is, you're supposed to be able to reach into these bits, these images and manipulate them. And this one wasn't working right. So, that's interesting, and what's going on is you have built this, this portal to the internet. It's got the, world, the world's information in it. It's got incredibly complex applications in it, but it's something that is incredibly easy to use with no training. So that's a different type of simplicity that people have added to an extremely complex system. And we're, you know, we're builders, we're developers. We, we should be aspiring to build things that you can give to a two-year-old and they can intuitively understand what, how they operate and what to do with them, right? That's, that's kind of, you could be really satisfied with yourself if you've managed 
companies to build something that has that level of intuition to it. And it was a huge amount of work at, at you know, particularly at Apple when they first came out with the, the touch, you know, the, the touch-based user interface, that it was that intuitive. So, um, what does it actually look like, though? Well, you know, I took my phone and, I, of course, I added about several hundred applications to it, and then I grouped them. And if I give my phone to my wife or I pick up my wife's phone, I can't find anything on it. So it looks kind of like this. It's just a big mess of apps and stuff. So we get these things and we make them complicated again. But I did want to bring up a really good book. Uh, some of you may know XKCD, the cartoon. And Randall Munro wrote this am amazing book, The Thing Explainer book. It came out last year using only the 1,000 most common words in the English language, and I think it's actually the 1,000 most common words in the English language, because 1,000 isn't one of them. Um, he explains lots and lots of things, and this is, you know, this is a hand computer, and it's got all kinds of description about what's actually going on inside the phone, but in words that pretty much anyone can understand. So you can take complex things and reduce them to simple description. So that's an interesting thought way of thinking about this. All right, so that's kind of in our daily life. Let's talk a bit about the way we work and, and the things we do. So let's talk a bit about simplifying work. And one of the things that came out of Netflix, I mean, Netflix is several different things, right? There was the, you know, there's watching TV, right? There's that whole movie, movie and, and TV content. Then there's all the technology that, that has been largely adopted by the Spring platform. And then there's the cultural side, like the way Netflix operates. And one of the really interesting things that, that I was part of was the culture deck that came out of Netflix. The freedom and responsibility culture. This is a slide share with 15 million views. <laughs> 15 million views for a slide deck. <laughs> all right, that's, that's, that's ridiculous all on its own. But then, you know, Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook said this may be one of the most important documents ever to come out of the valley and got Reed Hastings to be on Facebook's board <laughs> to, to try and learn what the hell was going on there. So that's interesting. The story I have is I joined Netflix in 07, and when I was interviewing at Netflix, they were trying to explain this culture to me, and I, half the interview was them trying to explain what this strange set of ideas, and I found it fascinating. And one of the reasons I joined Netflix was to figure out how that worked and you know, really to get my head inside it. And in 2009, one of the management offsites, we, you know, Reed sent a mail out before the offsite saying, here's a deck, I want to publish this. Everyone go through it, annotate it, let's discuss it, let's discuss what we want to put, what we will say, what we won't say. And we all collectively, the management team then was maybe 100 to 200 people, 100, yeah, probably over 100 directors, VPs, all the people across the whole company. We worked on this document at the offsite, gave it back, and, and he w merged all of the input together and came up with the initial version of this. So it was a collective thing. But what we were doing was trying to preset the people we were hiring so that they wouldn't come in and be baffled and confused. They would see this document. If you were horrified by what it said in the document, you wouldn't even bother applying, and we wouldn't have to deal with you, like walking you out of the interview at the first, first you know, half, after the first half an hour. Um, in fact, nowadays, if you turn up for an interview at Netflix and you have not read this document, you can get walked out for like, what do you, you know, 15 million people have read it and you want to work, job, work here and you haven't figured it out? That doesn't make sense, All right? But what we found was that it started to condition people for the, how they expected to see when we onboarded them and it helped create the culture and maintain the culture. So intentional culture has become a really important thing. We've seen other companies do culture decks. Nordstrom has one. Uh, lo lots of other people have written down what do they value and published it externally in order to try and do that. So it's become a, a thing now, right? So think about how could you externalize that? And if you're doing a startup, if you're starting a company, you get to set the culture. And don't wait till the company gets big and you have accidental culture of whoever happened to be there. Be very intentional very early about what you want to have. So what is in this culture? So here's, here's a, an interesting, uh, just one slide from it. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn from the vast and endless sea. Right, that's interesting. That's a purpose-driven culture. It's like if everyone agrees what the purpose of the company is, then they will figure out how to implement that purpose. The implementation, you don't need to do fine grain, um, sort of telling everybody what to do. Uh, you, know, you, know, you can just set, this is where we need to go, everyone else figure it out. 
And this is from a, a, a book called The Little Prince. And this, this was in the original deck in 09. And it just happens that Netflix has a deal for The Little Prince. And oops, come back. There we go. Um, it releases tomorrow. <laughs> so tomorrow night, this is a pure, pure luck thing. There's an animated show. It's an it's a excellent little movie. You can go, go home tomorrow night and watch The Little Prince with your kids and be all inspired and hope, note when this quote comes by. <laughs> right. So, so that's, in, that's a whole interesting area. But what we're truly doing here, think of the simplicity here is how simple is it to have a purpose and express a purpose? Purposes are a simple statement, right? That's a simplifying thing. Setting out all the individual processes that you would need to make people gather the wood and build ships and stuff is much more complicated. So it's actually easier and simpler to express a purpose-driven culture, and then it self-organizes around that. And one of the other things we found, if you impose process on people, it drives talent away. This is a big problem because you, everyone needs more talent, right? Um, and I was trying to explain this, and I was doing one of my explanations of this is all the Netflix stuff, and this is what we did, and I was doing it at a, an, an executive CIO, CTO summit, and somebody said, yeah, we can't copy Netflix because it has all these superstar engineers, and we don't have those people. And I looked around the name badges of the companies and said, well, we hired them from you, right? We had those, you had these people at some point. We got them, you know, they, we don't, there isn't a cloning machine at Netflix that sort of produces Netflix engineers from, from nothing, right? They come from other places and they bring experiences with them. And what we found over and over again was that people would be, were producing a fraction of what they could produce at most companies because they were being held back by the process and by stupid rules and by all kinds of things that were just slowing them down. And when you get out of the way of innovation and you get behind people, you find that you magnify their ability to do things. And you can, you can get many, many times more out of a, sen a good senior engineer by getting behind them and pushing instead of getting in front of them and, and getting in their way. Right? So there's a lot of tricks to how to actually get that done. But that is the essential reason why we were able to do, with a relatively small team, build an awful lot of things and, and build a very pioneering culture. So this is, this is one of the things about Netflix, and that, that time I was there, was that we, kept, we built a culture and a, and a team that could build things that had never been built before. And it's, it's moved on now. I mean, you, don't, you can build on top of those things, right? So how do you organize think, people? Um, well, it wouldn't be like a microservices presentation without Conway's law in it. So I, this is the full, full thing for Conway's law. The basic thesis of this article is that organizations design systems are constrained to produce designs that are copies of the communication structures of the organizations. So it turns out the way Netflix was structured was there's lots of autonomous groups with sort of relationships between them for, and APIs between them. And when we wrote a bunch of code, it came up with this architecture that is now called microservices. So we started with a company organization that was already cellular in nature with lots of local responsibility and lots of fairly you know, well-defined interfaces. And if you're trying to build a microservice architecture and you haven't got that, that, that organization, you're going to have a lot of trouble. The people that are succeeding in this space have co-located small teams that, are do work, that own a thing. And they own all of the different stages in producing that thing. And then they have relationships to other teams. So they're very high trust, high cohesion within a team, and relatively low trust, trust across teams. And in the, t in the uh, two and a half years since I left Netflix, I've been talking to lots of enterprises who've been trying to figure out how do we apply the lessons here to an enterprise that's much bigger, much more complicated, maybe government organizations, which are low trust organizations. And you say, well, you have a small group that has high trust and you really want them to be co-located and own a thing, and then have a trust boundary to the other parts. And you can have low trust across those boundaries. And it's really no different to programming on the internet. Like, I can use an API from Google or Twitter or wherever, right? and I don't necessarily have to have a high trust and know the people that implemented the Google Maps API to use it. Right? It's just an API to a thing, and I assume a stable API. So you build your organization out of a series of stable APIs. And because they're people you can go talk to, you can maybe mutate those APIs a bit more readily than if you go and you know, ask Google for a new feature for Google Maps. But you've got a bit more leverage, but you should be treating these things as stable interfaces between parts of your company to build everything out. So what I'm really saying here is that 
if you build purpose-driven cultures and systems thinking based approaches, that you're building flexible uh, models for building companies. And you're building organizations that can evolve with, as technology moves on. And you're, if you, the more rules you put in, the more complex it gets and the more rigid it gets. And you end up with this sort of scenario where we have version two of the company architecture. And three years later, there's a sort of a huge piece of work to trying to get to version three of that architecture. And a few years later, it's like, you know, a huge project to get everything to version four of the architecture. Right? Th those are the, that's kind of old, rigid-based way of thinking about it. What you want to do is build an architecture that's continuously evolving. There's no actual version of Netflix. There's no version of the system there. It's a collection of hundreds of versions that, that are changing all the time. Right? So one more sort of thought here. There's one thing you can do if you're, if you're trying to get to this kind of model. One, one systems thinking sort of trick to try. And this comes from one of the first um, sort, of, sort of things that we really took, took to heart in, in 2009 when we started looking at that, which was Werner Vogels in 2006 published an article about what, the way that Amazon was doing stuff. And he said, you built it, you run it. Because if you built some code, you're on call for that code. If you do nothing but put your developers on call, it will make the biggest difference. It's the place to start. Because magically, developers then start writing reliable code that doesn't break. And they don't push stuff to production on Friday afternoons because they want to go home for the weekend and not have to deal with broken things. And all kinds of, you know, you're sending the pain back to where it can do the most good. If you put an ops team in charge of production and say, I throw it over the wall and it's their problem, then you know, you're, you're giving up on that feedback loop. It's very powerful, and it's one of the things we did. So we went from an architecture, a monolithic architecture of everyone wrote a jar file, and QA mashed it together into this big monster. And every two weeks, we'd try and get this monster into production, which would usually take several days of debugging to get the thing to work right, to everyone that was delivering a jar now delivered a service that incorporated that jar with an API, and you could manage. You were on call if that service broke. Right, so that, that was the transition we went through, and it, it cleaned everything up enormously. All right, so that's how I think you can simplify the way you run your organizations and take some lessons from the cultural changes there. And I'm seeing lots of large companies doing this. This is not just a, you know, unicorns get to do this, but really everybody is doing this now, and the people that are being successful are doing a good job of it. So let's talk about the things we built. How can we simplify the products we're trying to build, and how do we decide what even to build? And one of the first things I, I suggest you try to do is to get away from thinking about projects and start thinking about products. And unfortunately, if your title is project manager, it's not a good time. <laughs> See if you can find a company that hasn't done this yet and go work there for a while while you try and learn to code or something. But I'm sorry, there really aren't any project managers in this new model. And the ratio of develop productive developers to overhead to staff that are involved in managing and delivering stuff radically changes. You have more developers and fewer people doing deployment and management and delivery. And that ratio has to change because that's really your competitors that have figured this out have already changed that ratio. So that's, that's kind of the bad news, if you like. Um, so the thing about a project is you form a team to go and you know, do something like upgrade SAP, or is, is all my sort of horrific thing. You spend nine months desperately trying to get this thing upgraded, and then everybody runs away from the project in horror and goes and work to work on something else. And operations is left holding this thing, which is no longer able to change, right? And they are locked into it, and they are locked into that vendor, and they cannot get in. If you're in a product environment where your team owns a product, they own the continuous evolution of that product, they're continuously unlocking it. They are, they are changing from one tech version of a technology to another. They're switching out one API to another. They're switching from one you know, technology or, or hardware platform to another as small incremental changes in the evolution of the thing you're building. So it's very hard to get locked in. And in fact, I have a whole talk I did on this where I pointed out that basically developers don't care about lock-in because they're continuously unlocking anyway. And it's the ops people that get stuck with the thing that hate lock-in. And I came up, this was actually last summer, and there was a little bit, um, 
I basically pointed out that it was kind of like the developers were dating and getting married, and then the ops people were dealing with the divorces. Right? <laughs> and you, then you start, why don't ops people like lock-in? Because the divorces are not nice things, right? And if that's your general experience of technology is you're trying to unlock yourself from it, it's a very unhappy thing. So if the developers own the whole life cycle, they'll just keep dating. <laughs> Right? And they'll never actually get that locked into a thing, and they'll keep unlocking from it, right? So the analogy gets a bit stretched here, but you get the general idea, right? So, so that's one of the reasons why this is such a powerful move. You're building a, a team that owns a piece of the system that is continuously evolving that system. And if that piece of the system stops evolving, very rapidly, you just put it in some maintenance mode, but you still need somebody that owns it because there'll be a heart bleed bug or something, and you'll have to go and rev it with some new base components so the platform will change underneath it. Even if the business logic doesn't change, the platform's going to continue to change. So somebody needs to be responsible keeping it working. OK, so that's one thing. What's another? What, people, we were, we were, I was at the CIO summit yesterday. I was wearing my jacket. I always wear a jacket, but I'm pretending I'm a CIO kind of person or something. Um, I noticed that you know, everyone else is wearing t-shirts on stage, but I decided I'd just keep stick with this. So people are saying, what is the thing, what's the thing you want to optimize for? What's the metric? And the one I think that people should be optimizing for is time to value. Like, if you write a piece of code or you build a thing and it's not reached a customer yet, it's not added value. Right? How quickly does the thing you did get in front of a customer so you can find out, does it work? Does it add value? If you're in a hypothesis testing environment, is this hypothesis now in test mode where you can find out, is this new version of the sign-up flow got a better conversion rate than the old version or whatever you're working on, right? So figure out how to build a value chain all the way from the customer down through all the different components and dependencies and figure out how to get a better time to value on it. So that's the really interesting thing. Another thought, and this is something that's a little subtle, optimize for the customers you want to have rather than the customers you have now. Right? So what does that mean? If you think about, just take the example of a SaaS application like Netflix. You get a month's free trial, and then at the end of that month, they're saying, oh, please, give us, please give us 10 bucks. <laughs> please stay, off, stay on and be a customer for another month. Right? So almost every test at Netflix is optimizing for that conversion from free trial to paying customer. And if you're in a SaaS business with a free trial, that's what you're optimizing for. What you're actually optimizing for is for customers who've never seen the product before. Right? And that causes the product to stay simple. Like you think, you know, going back to Netflix, they just launch globally. If, if, you're, if you live in Zimbabwe and all of a sudden there's this thing called Netflix you've never heard of, and you're trying, somebody's trying to explain it to you, the more complex and the more features there are in it, the more confusing it will be, the harder it will be to figure out, and the less likely you are to sign up and convert to a paying customer. So there's a built-in feedback loop here which keeps the product simple. Now, power users are always annoyed that there aren't all these clever features that they keep thinking of that Netflix should do, right? And you end up with like, you know, Word or something, you know, with millions of features that no one knows how to use, right? Um, you know, unless you're a lawyer. <laughs> you know, like the lawyers know how to use it, you know, about half the features in Word, because but that's the power, power thing that they do, the redlining documents. So think about this. If you optimize for the customer's you, I mean, sometimes the business you're in, you have a fixed set of customers. You're not actually trying to grow. You're trying to extract more value or hold on to a customer base. Yes, you should optimize for the customers you want to keep. But if you optimize for your power users, the product will get more and more complicated, and you will mysteriously discover you get fewer and fewer new customers. And you're basically painting yourself into the corner where you are going to get disrupted by the next simple product that doesn't have all your features. So why would anyone care about that? <laughs> it's missing all these features. Well, that means people can figure out how to use it. Right? So think about, think about that as how you, you should be simplifying the things that you're trying to build and, and optimizing for the customers you want to have rather than the customers you already have. All right, so we talked a bit about the product itself, about how do we build these products. You, know, you get to drink again now. So here's another microservices thing. Um, monolithic apps. People say, well, they look simpler. 
than microservices. Well, actually, they're more complex. They only look simple from the outside. If you draw your architecture diagram with one box on it, that looks simple. But then you look at the number of things it's talking to. It's obviously not really simple. And then you look, try and look inside it. And one of the things um, we did at Netflix once was we tried to create a, a object hierarchy of our monolithic app. And it was spread. I, mean, I think there was a line of cubes about as wide as this stage, and it was an eight-point font. And the object hierarchy was wallpapered on this thing. And I've, Bill Jackson, somewhere in the audience, saying he went and built this, this enormous object hierarchy so you could see just how complex this thing was inside. It was just massive layers of Java methods and stuff. So what happens when you break it into chunks? I mean, you find out how, how tangled together it is when you try and break it into chunks. So microservices enforce a separation that makes it less complicated. So if anyone ever says microservices are too complicated, no, they're not. They're less complicated. Like, argue, fight back. Argue back on that one. You're isolating things. You're, you're preventing thing, you know, methods from creeping in and gathering data where they shouldn't be seeing it. You're preventing end runs around methods to go into the data store. That's, you, that you can see what the real connectivity of your application is. And then think about onboarding a new engineer. You've hired somebody from outside. They've never seen the system at all. And you say, OK, change this monolith. Right, how, how, what's the probability that they'll get that right? It's a lot of stuff they need to learn. Or you say, change this microservice. It's got three inputs. It's got two dependencies. It does one thing. It's, uh, the code can fit in one engineer's head. And they sit down, and they go, OK, I've changed this. I've safely modified a piece of the system because it's this bounded context. It's a simpler thing. So it's simpler to learn. It's simpler to get people on board. And it's simpler to manage. And the problem back in 20, 2009, 2010 is the tooling, the monitoring systems couldn't deal with it. Right? We were trying to build a monitoring system that could deal with the microservice architecture. And they were blowing up. And they, we had to build our own. And it just got too complex. But you know, we, I went at the expo today, and we have you know, monitoring vendors saying, yes, microservices. We know how to monitor those things. The tooling is now there. They are now much easier to deal with. So, yeah, don't get, don't get the pushback that it's more too complex. So if we're trying to build these architectures, so how do we keep the architecture simple? And there's four principles I like to, to encourage. One is symmetry. Like Every time something is more symmetric, it effectively, you've created an invariant. You've created, like, if the UK, if, if, you have, if you've deployed in more than one region on AWS and your deployment is exactly the same in an automated manner, you've created a symmetry. You've now got an invariant. It's going to behave the same way. You don't have to write a different like, set of processes for dealing with this thing versus this thing. Um, so commonality is important. You want to think how you're doing it because you still want to be evolving. Right? So you don't want to, to say, I need everything to be the same. But you need to look for places where you can create symmetry because that creates invariance. And that lets you create assertions that things are in a, in a known state. And automation is really the key here. Like, if you know every machine in an auto scale group or, or, or running in a thing is running exactly the same build, it's the same build pack, it's the same AMI, it's the same whatever, then you know it's the same thing. And we used to have problems in our data center where we didn't have, even have the same firmware revision on all the machines we were running, and that would cause problems, right? That you can get into some very low level problems. And then the final thing is just systems thinking, trying to figure out ways to get feedback loops that drive people to do the right things and drive machines to do the right things. And I've done talks in a lot of detail into this. You can go find my SlideShare account if you want to get more, more on that. OK, so just to wrap up a bit, where are we going next? You know, what, what's the next thing we're going to be doing? And how do we figure out how do we get there? What, what, how do we spot what's happening? And I like this quote. Um, there's a book on systems thinking and, and creating the platform designing business architecture. We see the world as increasingly more complex and chaotic because we use inadequate concepts to explain it. Once you have the concepts, once you've built your mental models, all of a sudden, it's no longer chaotic or, com or complex. Like, think about driving a car. There is a mental model around driving and how cities work and how traffic works. Once you've got that model, it's no longer chaotic or complex. You can drive to work and barely even think about driving to work. Right? You've said, oh, I just suddenly arrived. You know, you're on autopilot in, in your brain the whole way. So we're dealing with a lot of technologies, and we need a model to figure out which ones are changing fast and which ones are, are maybe not changing. 
Uh, and the model I like to use is something from Simon Wardley. He, he, um, he divides things into things that are innovating, things that are being leveraged, and things that are commoditizing. And I've got a link to his blog post here, but it's easy. If you actually Google innovate, leverage, commoditize, it's the first hit. <laughs> it's pretty easy to find. Um, what am I talking about here? Well, for innovate, let's, let's go back to something that's um, from like 10 years ago was an innovation, right? You can tell it's an innovation because people are arguing about it and the words aren't very well defined. And let's think of, say, something like virtual machines. When they first came out, it was controversial, right? And then we figured out, OK, we have virtual machines, but yeah, we get VMs. That sounds like a good thing. And the tooling is starting to come together. And now you can buy them from VMware and Citrix and Microsoft. And then there's KVM. And so we've got four different implementations. So now we're in the leverage phase, right? It's a well understood concept where we've got lots of different implementations. And maybe we have to switch implementations occasionally. And we're getting there. And then we got to public cloud. And I'm using, say, AWS or Google. I have no idea. I was like, is it KVM or it's Zen, I'm told. I have no idea. It's invisible part of the platform I'm using is that there's a, there's a VM system there. It's commoditized out. Don't care anymore. I'm not spending money on virtualization management stuff. It's just baked into the things I'm using. So that's, think of that kind of cycle and where we are in things. So in, innovation stage. Uh, right now, I'd say things like serverless are in this stage. People are still arguing about serverless and what it means and all these things. It's a relatively poorly defined concept. Some people have still not heard of it. And what you're seeing is pioneer adoption. All right, so there are definitely people out there doing it. But you can mostly ignore it unless it, it actually seems to like, push your buttons and you want to go play with it. So that's kind of, kind of the where, where it is right now. I've also called serverless architectures monitoringless architectures, because we can't figure out where to install any monitoring agents for it, and you know, you're, you're kind of stuck. So there's a number of places where this has got some really interesting characteristics. We'll go play with it. That's a fine thing. Even beyond the innovation stage, we, we, you know, so what's the opposite to a microservice? So my, my opposite is a Terra service. Um, you can actually sort of almost get, there. it's not quite public yet, but both AWS and Azure have multi-terabyte instance sizes coming. Right? They've announced them, and they've not quite got them out yet. But for $14 an hour, you can get a two terabyte machine with 128 vCPUs running on it, virtual CPUs running on it, uh, for $14 an hour. And I just want to see what people are going to do when they finally get their hands on that thing, because it's going to be amazing. And then uh, it's even harder to find, but uh, Azure have a three terabyte one. Uh, but they, they were announced around SAP for the SAP HANA product, which is an in-memory system, but they're going to be generally available. So that, think of that as an innovation that's still out there, hasn't quite happened yet, and I'm just trying to put a label on it. They call it terab terab terabyte scale services. So forget these tiny little uh, 10 lines of node. I'm trying to figure out how to run a you know, two terabyte graph database in memory or something. So that's what I think is interesting at the innovation stage. It's going to be you know, maybe next year, in a year's time, there'll be people talking about these, these things that they're able to do they weren't able to do. If you look at the leverage stage, people get the concept. Right? We know we need to do this thing. We've pretty much understood it. The terminology is no longer controversial. But there's too many choices. Like, so how many different ways are there to schedule a Docker container right now? It's just ridiculous. And they're every week, there's another one, probably. Right? <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I mean, you can do it with Cloud Foundry. You can do it you know, with Kubernetes and Swarm and Nomad and Mesos. And I've probably forgotten two or three of them. Um, too many choices. But you're getting mainstream adoption. And this is where you have to be able to continually evolve, because maybe you pick one for now, and then another one hits 1.0. Like yesterday, Mesos hit 1.0, if anyone can. You know, fine. OK, maybe we should be using Mesos now, because it's 1.0, whatever. But the people make decisions as things mature, and maybe the best option moves around as they add more features. Or, and then eventually, they all end up having the same feature set. And there was a Twitter discussion yesterday, because Kubernetes is now going to add frameworks, and Mesos has added pods. and. I know, Swarm and Nomad are all like, bundled everything into one process. So things are getting to the point where people are kind of figuring out what is the feature set that matters on this platform. And you can get it all jammed into one thing. And then it starts to become a commodity. Right. And it's at the commodity stage, you just stop worrying about it. So 
the point about commodities is there's multiple compatible implications. I have a container that needs to run, and I don't care who's running it for me. I don't care whether I'm running it under Cloud Foundry with Diego, or I'm running it on, um, on Google Container Engine, or Amazon ECS, or something or other on, on, on Azure. I just don't care. Right, that's the commodity level, and we're not quite there with container schedulers, but I think we're getting there with platforms now. And this, this is really good to see. This is the Spring One platform conference. You know, we have Cloud Foundry, and we have the Spring Cloud, Spring Boot stuff, and it's just there. And if you're doing Java, it doesn't, there isn't really anything else out there that's, that's got this level of support that's just going to give you all of this stuff. It's, you don't need to go build it yourself anymore. You need to build on top of it. You need to go build something interesting that is your product that's going to you know, be the next generation thing that adds your business value. Because if you, have, if you decide you're going to do a microservices architecture, I published one time a little thing with boxes for every different piece of the architecture. And you could spend two weeks trying to figure out what to put in each of those boxes. Or you could just say, uh, let's just do Spring Boot on Cloud Foundry and use a bunch of those Netflix projects that got bundled into it and move on to the discussion. It's scaffolding. It's kind of like Ruby on Rails. The Rails system is scaffolding, so you don't have to think about this. You can build stuff really quickly and get on with your life. And I think that is, that it, it's great to see these technologies that we were pioneering five years ago turn into something that is now just a ubiquitous platform that you can just go use and build new innovations on top. And I'm just really interested to see you know, where this goes. And it's not that the platform stops changing. It's continuing to evolve. But it's evolving as a commodity with lots of, lots of competing implementations and lots of suppliers. And you've got a market here. So I'm very encouraged to see that. And that's basically it. So I'd like to say thank you and get uh, Andrew back up here. Well, thanks so much.